The Revolution of Everyday Life by Raoul Venegem. Chapter 6, Decompression and the Third Force. Until now, tyranny has merely changed hands. And their common respect for rulers, antagonistic powers, have always fostered the seeds of their future coexistence. When the leader of the game takes the power of a leader, the revolution dies with the revolutionaries. Unresolved antagonisms fester, hiding real contradictions. Decompression is the permanent control of both antagonists by the ruling class. Uh, The third force radicalizes contradictions and leads to their supersession in the name of individual freedom and against all forms of constraint. Power has no option but to smash or incorporate the third force without admitting its existence. To sum up, millions of men lived in a huge building with no doors or windows. The feeble light of countless oil lamps competed with the unchanging darkness. As had been the custom since remotest antiquity, the upkeep of the lamps was the duty of the poor, so that the flow of oil followed the alternation of revolt and pacification. One day, a general insurrection broke out, the most violent that this people had ever known. Its leaders demanded a fair allotment of the costs of lighting. A large number of revolutionaries said that what they considered a public utility should be free. A few extremists went so far as to clamor for the destruction of the building, which they claimed was unhealthy, even unfit for human habitation. As usual, the more reasonable combatants found themselves helpless before the violence of the conflict. During a particularly lively clash with the forces of order, a stray bullet pierced the outer wall, leaving a crack through which daylight streamed in. After a moment of stupor, this flood of light was greeted with cries of victory. The solution had been found. All they had to do was to make some more holes. The lamps were thrown away or put in museums, and power fell to the window makers. The partisans of radical destruction were forgotten, and even their discreet liquidation, it seems, went almost unnoticed. Everyone was arguing arguing about the number and position of the windows. Then, a century or two later, their names were remembered, when the people, that eternal malcontent, had grown accustomed to plate glass windows and took to asking extravagant questions. To drag out our days in a greenhouse, is that living? They asked. The consciousness of our time oscillates between that of the walled-up man and that of the prisoner. For the individual, the oscillation takes the place of freedom. Like a condemned man, he paces up and down between the blank wall of a cell and the barred window that represents the possibility of escape. If somebody knocks a hole in the cellar of isolation... Hope filters in with the light. The good behavior of the prisoner depends on the hope of escape which prisons foster. On the other hand, when he is trapped by a wall with no windows, a man can only feel the desperate rage to knock it down or break his head against it, which can only be seen as unfortunate from the point of view of efficient social organization. Even if the suicide doesn't have the happy idea of going to his death and the style of an oriental price, immolating all his slaves. Oh, maybe that's supposed to be prince. Judges, bishops, generals, policemen, psychiatrists, philosophers, managers, specialists, planners. The man who is walled up alive has nothing to lose. The prisoner still has hope. Hope is the leash of submission. When power's boiler is in danger of exploding, it uses its safety valve to lower the pressure. It seems to change. In fact, it only adapts itself and resolves its difficulties. There is no authority which does not see rising against it, an authority which is similar but which passes for its opposite. But nothing is more dangerous for the principle of hierarchical government than the merciless confrontation of two powers driven by a rage for total annihilation. In such a conflict, the tidal wave of fanaticism carries away the most stable values. No man's land eats up the whole map, establishing everywhere the interregnum of nothing is true, everything is permitted. 
History, however, offers not one example of a titanic conflict, which is not opportunely diffused and turned into a comic opera battle. What is the source of this decompression? The agreement on matters of principle which is implicitly breached by the warring powers. The hierarchical principle remains common to the fanatics of both sides. Opposite the capitalism of Lloyd George and Krupp appears the anti-capitalism of Lenin and Trotsky. From the mirrors of the masters of the present, the masters of the future are already smiling back. Heinrich Hein writes, Oh God, it's a bunch of German shit with no translation, so I cannot read German. If it even is German. I assume it's German. It looks like German. The tyrant dies smiling, for he knows that after his death, tyranny will merely change hands, and slavery will never end. Bosses differ according to their modes of domination, but they are still bosses, owners of a power exercised as a private right. Lenin's greatness has to do with his romantic refusal to assume the position of absolute master, implied by his ultra-hierarchical organization of the Bolshevik Party. And it is to this greatness also that the workers' movement is indebted for Kronstadt, Budapest, and uh, Batuchka, Stalin. From this moment, the point of contact between the two powers becomes the point of decompression. To identify the enemy with evil and crown one's own side with the halo of good has the strategic advantage of ensuring unity of action by canalizing the energy of the combatants. But this maneuver demands the annihilation of the enemy. Moderates hesitate before such a prospect, for the radical destruction of the enemy would include the destruction of what their own side has in common with the enemy. The logic of Bolshevism demanded the heads of the leaders of social democracy. The latter hastily sold out, and they did so precisely because they were leaders. The logic of anarchism demanded the liquidation of Bolshevik power. The latter rapidly crushed them and did so in as much as it was hierarchical power. The same predictable sequence of betrayals threw Derudi's anarchists before the united guns of Republicans, Socialists, and Stalinists. As soon as the leader of the game turns into a leader, the principle of hierarchy is saved and the revolution sits down to preside over the execution of the revolutionaries. We must never forget that the revolutionary project belongs to the masses alone. Leaders help it. Leaders betray it. To begin with, the real struggle takes place between the leader of the game and the leader. The professional revolutionary measures the state of his force, the state of his forces in quantitative terms, just as any soldier judges an officer's rank by the number of men under his command. The leaders of so-called insurrectionary parties dismiss the qualitative in favor of a quantitative expertise. Um, had the Reds been blessed with half a million more men with modern weapons, the Spanish Revolution would still have been lost. It died under the heels of the people's commissars. The speeches of La Passionaria already sounded like funeral orations. Pathetic whining drowned the language of deeds, the spirit of the collectives of Aragon. The spirit of a radical minority resolved to sever with a single stroke all the heads of the Hydra, not just its fascist head. Never, and for good reason, has an absolute confrontation been carried through. So far the last fight has only had false starts. Everything must be resumed from scratch. History's only justification is to help us do it. Under the process of decompression, antagonists who seemed irreconcilable at first sight grow old together, become frozen in purely formal opposition, lose their substance, neutralize and molder into each other. Who would recognize the Bolshevik with his knife between his teeth in the Gagarinism of doting Moscow? Today, by the grace of the ecumenical miracle, the slogan Workers of the World Unite celebrates the union of the world's bosses, a touching scene. The common element in the antagonism, the seed of power, which a radical struggle would have rooted out, has grown up to reconcile the estranged brothers. Is it as simple as this? Of course not. 
the farce would lose its entertainment value. On the international stage, um, those two hold hams, capitalism and anti-capitalism, carry on their lover's banter. How the spectators tremble when they begin to quarrel, how they stamp with glee when peace blesses the loving couple. Is interest flagging? A brick is added to the Berlin Wall. The bloodthirsty Mao gnashes his paper teeth, while in the background a choir of little Chinese nitwits sings peons to fatherland, family, and work. Patched up like this, the old melodrama is ready to hit the road. The ideological spectacle keeps up with the times by bringing out harmless plastic antagonisms. Are you for or against Brigitte Bardot? The Beatles, minicars, hippies, nationalization, spaghetti, old people, the took, miniskirts, pop art, thermonuclear, thermo, thermonuclear war, hitchhiking. There is no one who is not accosted at every moment of the day by posters, news flashes, stereotypes, summoned to take sides over each of the prefabricated trifles that conscientiously stop up all the sources of everyday creativity. In the hands of power, these particular particles of antagonism are molded into a magnetic ring whose function is to make everybody lose their bearings, to pull everyone out of himself, and to scramble lines of force. Decompression is simply the control of antagonisms by power. The opposition of two terms is given its real meaning by the introduction of a third. As long as there are only two equal and opposite polarities, they neutralize each other since each is defined by the other. As it is impossible to choose between them, we are led into the domain of tolerance and relativity, which is so dear to the bourgeoisie. One can well understand the importance for the apostolic hierarchy of the dispute between Manichaeism and Trinitarianism. In a merciless confrontation between God and Satan, what would have been left of ecclesiastical authority? Nothing, as the malarian, millenarian crisis demonstrated. That is why the secular arm carried out its holy offices, and the pyres crackled for the mystics of God or the devil, those overbold theologians who questioned the principle of three in one. The temporal masters of Christianity were, were resolved that only they should be entitled to treat of the difference between the master of good and the master of evil. They were the great intermediaries through which the choice of one side or the other had to pass. They controlled the paths to salvation and damnation, and this control was more important to them than salvation and damnation themselves. On earth, they proclaimed themselves judges without appeal. Since they had also decided to be the judged in an afterlife, whose laws they had invented... The Christian myth diffused the bitter Manichaean conflict by offering to the believer the possibility of individual salvation. This was the breach opened up by the poor bugger of Nazareth. Thus man escaped the rigors of a confrontation which necessarily led to the same destruction of values, to nihilism. But the same stroke denied him the opportunity to reconquer himself by means of a general upheaval the chance of taking his place in the universe by chasing out the gods and their slave masters. Therefore, the movement of decompression appears to have the function of shackling man's most irreducible desire, the desire to be completely himself. In all conflicts between opposing sides, an irrepressible upsurge of individual desires takes place and often reaches a threatening intensity. To this extent, we are justified in talking of a third force. From the individual's point of view, the third force is what the force of decompression is from the point of view of power. The small chance of every st struggle. It radicalizes insurrections, denounces false problems, threatens power in its very structure. It is what Brecht was referring to in one of his Kuhner stories. When a proletarian was brought to court and asked if he wished to take the oath in the ecclesiastical or the lay form, he replied, I'm out of work. The third force does not hope for the withering away of constraints, but aims to supersede them. Prematurely crushed or incorporated, 
it becomes by inversion a force of decompression. Thus the salvation of the soul is nothing but the will to live, incorporated through myth, mediated, emptied of its real content. On the other hand, their peremptory demand for a full life explains the hatred incurred by certain Gnostic sects or by the brethren of the free spirit. During the decline of Christianity, the struggle between Pascal and the Jesuits spotlighted the opposition between the reformist doctrine of individual salvation and compromise with heaven and the project of realizing God by the nihilist destruction of the world. And once again, it had got rid of the dead wood of theology. The third force survived to inspire Babeuf's struggle against the uh, Million Doré, the Marxist project of the complete man, the dreams of Fourier, the explosion of the commune, and the violence of the anarchists. Individualism, alcoholism, collectivism, activism, the variety of ideologies shows that there are a hundred ways of being on the side of power. There's only one way to be radical. The wall that must be knocked down is immense, but it has been cracked so many times that soon a single cry will be enough to bring it crashing to the ground. Let the formidable reality of the third force emerge at last from the mists of history with all the individual passions that have fueled the insurrections of the past. Soon we shall find that an energy is locked up in everyday life which can move mountains and abolish distances. The long revolution is preparing to write works in the ink of action whose unknown or nameless authors will flock to join Sade, Fourier, Babeuf, Marx, Lassenaire, Stirner, uh, Lautremont, Lotier, Veillant, Henry, Villa, Zapata, Macno, the Communards, the Insurrectionaries of Hamburg, Kiel, Kronstadt, Asturias, all those who have not yet played their last card in a game which we have only just joined, the great gamble whose stake is freedom.